It's good to be here tonight, and I thank you for your lovely singing. That was very good. That did me good as I sat here to hear that lovely singing. Tonight the subject is, uh, here comes the Antichrist. And his number, of course, is 666. Next week, and one of the great cries of the media presently is World War Three or Armageddon. President Biden of the USA recently talked about nuclear Armageddon. He put the two words together. I think it was the pre just the week before last week. Nuclear Armageddon. He was thinking about the threat that Putin made to use nuclear weapons in the Ukraine. You're very welcome to these meetings and you're very welcome next week. I have underneath the, that title, uh, the Kings of the East. You have them involved. You have a, a 200 million group coming from the Far East. And we'll be looking at that because it brings in the nations of the Far East. And of course, most of the world's population at this moment is in the Far East. Tremendous figures of population. And we'll see what happens there from, we'll be looking at Revelation 19, Revelation 9. You're very welcome to the meetings. Tonight my subject is going to center on the Antichrist. And I want to just quickly, at the beginning, talk a little. We'll first of all be going, so you could turn in your Bibles to Daniel chapter 7. And while you're turning there, I'll introduce what I'm going to do here. <clears throat> We we'll start at Daniel chapter 7. But first of all, I'm going to just read out a thing I have here or that I've worked out to, regarding the Antichrist. He will be a mighty leader with a dynamic personality, a remarkable, it's amazing, remarkable persuasive ability. He's a great orator, and he has tremendous communication skills. I wonder is he alive today? Has he been on TV? Now listen, if I believed that Jesus Christ could come tonight in what I call the rapture, and I do, <coughs> And I know this from 2 Thessalonians 2, very, very plainly. It says there in verse 7 that the church, I believe, will be taken out. You see? But then if you go to verse 8, here's what it says. And then, then, once the church is taken out, it says, and then shall that wicked one be revealed. So, I've used this another night, you see, this group here would represent the, I believe, the church age. And at the end of the church age, the, the church will be taken up and taken out. The Lord himself is going to descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, the dead in Christ will rise first, they'll be resurrected. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up what amazing, to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we, listen to it, ever be with the Lord, you see. And that happens at the end of the church. It's now almost 2,000 years in length, you see, the, the church period. And when the church is taken out, if you go off over that wall into the next room, that's the tribulation period that comes, you see. There's going to be some terrible judgments, the seven seals. And the first seal is the white horse, isn't it? <laughs> Which I believe I could show you is the Antichrist. He's, he's going to appear straight away, just straight after the church is taken out. Then shall that wicked one be revealed, 
whom the Lord shall destroy with the, when he comes, when Jesus comes eventually in, in Revelation 19 to fight the battle of Armageddon, he's going to destroy the, the beast then, you see. But he rises out of a group of ten nations. And I'm going to try to show you tonight that this probably, now I use the word probably, will be Europe. You see? He will have a mark. And you, this, I think everybody here would know his mark, wouldn't you? It's 666. We have that in Revelation 13 and verse 18. Now another thing he's going to do, he's going to make a covenant or a, a treaty, a seven-year treaty with Israel. Now he couldn't have made that before 1948, you see because Israel wasn't there. It was on the 14th of May, 1948, that Israel became a nation on the maps of the world. And I've told you very often, I, I've been to New York, and I've been down there at the United Nations building, you see, and some of you here have been there too, and you notice all the flags of the world that are there, but there you just watch carefully. There's the Star of David right in the middle of them. That's the Israeli flag, you see. And as I stand here tonight, Israel are back in their country since the 14th of May, 1948. But before that, the beast couldn't make his covenant that you have in Daniel chapter, chapter 9 and verse 27. And, and of course, the beast, he could do it now because they're back there. He's going to do that. He's going to come in peaceably. And of course, the white horse would maybe speak of that a wee bit, you know. In that sense, he's going to come in peaceably and he's going to help Israel. Now listen to this. I think he probably will do this. He'd probably help Israel to build their temple. And that's going to be some job. If you go to Jerusalem, and I've been there, and go out to the sort of eastern side, you, you get there the Dome of the Rock, the Muslim mosque. and another, You get two Muslim mosques there in that site. And then you get the Wailing Wall as well. And dare you touch that site, you know, it's well guarded. But Scripture is very clear that the, 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 there's going to be, have to be a temple built there. And if you know anything about Second Thessalonians 2, and we, we, this was read this morning in the morning meeting, the beast is going to sit in the temple, we're told, and he's going to proclaim himself God there. So it's going to have to be a temple. And if you, if you go to Revelation 11, verse 1, that the temple's measured there in what we would call the tribulation period. And the, the, the Gentiles have access to that part of, of Jerusalem to, to, uh, as they do have today. But he'll be defeated at Armageddon by Jesus. Jesus then in, in Revelation 19, then he's going to be king of kings and lord, lord of lords. I sort of doubt the idea that Jesus is king now. You see, I, 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 I quibble that a wee bit. He certainly is. In, in Psalm 110, it says that uh, David's writing, here's what David says. He says, the Lord, that's God, said unto my Lord, that's Jesus, God talking to Jesus. Here's, here's what God says to Jesus, even back in the Psalms. Sit thou, that's Jesus, sit thou on my right hand until I make thine enemies the footstool of thy feet. And of course you get that verse quoted a few times in the New Testament, and particularly in 1 Corinthians 15, in that context, that Jesus is going to have his, his enemies at the moment, he hasn't them under his feet. But in Revelation 19, he will. And he'll be king of kings and lord of lords. You see, but that's okay. You might disagree with that, but you can if you want to. I'll not stop you. As long as you don't get at me too much. <laughs> now, the Roman Empire uh, officially ended in 476 A.D. Now, there was a guy called Gibbons 
a, a very qualified historian who has wrote this. The, the Roman Empire started in 68 BC and continued to 476 AD, you see. It was a mighty empire. But he says it finished then. But I, I challenge it a bit because a, a lot of the countries who were in the Roman Empire are still there. You take Britain, for example. You have your Great North Road. Well, many of you would say to me, oh, yes, that M1. Now, that's a Roman road. It was the Romans who laid the foundation for the M1 from London up to York. A beautiful straight highway. If you go to Bath, you get other Roman remains. I could go on, I could talk about Hadrian's Wall, I could talk about the... You could go to other countries, you could go to France and get the same, you could go to Germany and get the same, and you could go to Spain and get the same, and there's other countries into the Muslim world, and you get the same idea, these massive temples that all that the... That they, put, that they put up, you see. So the old Roman Empire is still traceable today, you see. But the Bible predicts this, that there will be a revival of this ancient empire in ten states. Now, I'll, I'll be looking at that in a moment. Now, this is just, a, this is just a, a sort of an opening gambit. Uh, and, of course, headed off by a cruel dictator with his 666 number. Now, I believe, I believe in the Bible, and we'll do this now. We'll go back to Daniel chapter 7. Let's go to Daniel chapter 7, and we'll try to sort of get a few of these uh, particular prophecies underway. Daniel chapter 7. No, we'll, we'll take Daniel, go just a few pages back to Daniel 2. I'll be using that previous one. Okay, this, this is what we're after here. Daniel 2, it, there's a great image here in chapter 2. Nebuchadnezzar dreams, as you see, but then he can't remember his dream, so he, he, he issues it out to people that he thinks could do it, and they, they, there are in, uh, down in verse uh, 6 and verse 7, verse 8, and there's, there's guys that interpret dreams, but they, they, can't, they can't get any answer to it. Because the point is, too, he can't remember his dream. I'm sure, many, I'm sure you remember having a dream and you can't remember it. I'm sure you've had that experience. But then sometimes you have a dream and it's vivid, you know. I used to have a neighbor when I was growing up as a boy. He was an older man. And he used to interpret our dreams for us. Amazing. <coughs> And I can remember vividly all his explanations and all about these dreams that we had. But this guy, Nebuchadnezzar, he has dreamed a dream. And as ver the end of verse 8 says, because you wouldn't gain the time, because you see the thing is gone from me, in verse 8. He, he can't remember what he has dreamed. And that makes it all the harder to interpret. But of course, Daniel eventually, uh, verse 19 he reveals this dream. But I want you to look at this dream. You see, it's really a history lesson. You have Babylon, the head of gold. Then you have Medo Persia, which, of course, this is, this is gold, of course, and this one is silver, you know. And then you have the Grecian Empire. This is brass. And when you come down to these legs, they're iron. And they're the Roman Empire. And then you have the feet and the toes. These toes will be important as we look. And they're part iron and part clay. And I could go into the details of that, but time tonight wouldn't allow me. But it's an amazing factor that 
uh, you can see that from gold down to iron, there's a deterioration in the strength of the metals. But there's a, there's a de there's a de uh, well, that's wrong, I'm saying it wrongly. The, the strength of the metals get stronger as you get down to the legs. You see, gold is a very soft metal, silver, a bit stronger, brass, yes, but the strongest one is the iron, you see? And I could go into the sea. Those actually represent, as you can see here, different nations that rise in history. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and then Rome. Now, I want you to just look at, in, in this chapter 2, uh, look at verse 44. And we'll get, maybe try to get close to this. It says, in the, in the days of these kings, and I'm sort of jumping over the, 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 these kings at the moment. Uh, it would take a full meeting to deal with it in, in detail. But verse 44 says, And in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. You see. And then uh, the, 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 this points forward to a kingdom. But then look at verse 45. For as much as I saw us, as I saw us, that the stone, now look at this here. I don't think the stone is, is the stone in any of these? Uh, no, the, the stone isn't in it. I'll go back to this one, you see. It says that a, a stone cut out without hands, that it break in pieces the iron, the br brass, the silver, and the gold, and what shall come to pass hereafter in the dream of certain. Now, what's going to happen there is, there's a stone cut out without hands that's going, now there it is, of course. Some, somebody must have moved that. <laughs> I, I was searching on my thing, but I'm a, I'm a, a wiser person down here. A stone hits the image at the feet. That's interesting, where the ten toes are. And I'll just tell you the secret of that, because that stone is Jesus. And we'll be looking at this as we continue. At the ten toes, you see, which is, is the beast kingdom, which eventually will be the beast kingdom. And the stone is going to hit the image at the bottom there, and the whole thing is going to come down, you see. It's, it's useless in that sense. And that's Jesus coming in power and glory in Revelation chapter 19 to destroy the beast and his compatriots at, at Armageddon when he finally fights that. Jesus has the victory. I want to say this tonight, that the Lord Jesus himself came to this earth almost 2,000 years ago, and he suffered on a cross. I'm sure you all heard that before. Jesus suffered on the cross. But you mightn't have heard the full impact of that. You see, Jesus was the put spikes through his beautiful, those lovely hands that did those lovely miracles. They put those spikes through his hands, and they weren't shiny six-inch nails. They were rough iron spikes driven through his hands into the wood of the cross and driven through his feet into the wood of the cross. Jesus was crucified. You see, terribly, suffered terribly. But they put on his head a crown of thorns or they whacked his back, they scourged him, they mocked on him, and they spat on him. Dreadful what Jesus had to suffer on his way to the cross. But here's what I, Isaiah 53 and verse 6 says. It says, the Lord, as God, hath laid on him, as Jesus, the iniquity or the sin of us all. Did you ever see that before? God putting the sin of the world, laying it on Jesus. The Lord God has laid on him, Jesus, the sin of everybody. It says in 2 Corinthians 5 and 21, for he, that's God, has made him, that's Jesus Christ, to be sin for us. And you know sin. 
that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And I want to say that Jesus has the victory. He had the victory on the cross. And your sin, I don't know who you are here tonight. I know a good many of you people. But your sin has been laid on Jesus. The, Jesus took the punishment from God. God punished Jesus for your sin that you could be saved. Amazing. Now, it's, that's the one we're going to eventually talk about, even in this meeting here. But I want us to go now to Daniel 7 that we looked at at the, at the start. Look at this clock. This clock fairly goes. Time goes faster in our mouth than put it out. <laughs> now, this is a second sort of a dream. And here's here. I'll just go through it. The first, these are beasts, you see, the lion, the bear, the leopard, and here you have this creature, which of course is the Roman Empire, you know, and that's the Babylonian Empire, the Medo-Persian, the Grecian, and the Roman Empire. And then, of course, what's happening here is, if we look at this carefully, look at verse 7 of chapter 7. After this, I saw in the night vision, behold, a fourth beast, dreadful, terrible, strong, exceedingly, and it had great iron teeth. Of course, that iron thing associates us with the image of Daniel 2. It devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it, and it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it. And notice this. It had ten horns. Now in chapter 2 there was ten toes. But here you have ten horns. I consider the horns, Daniel says, and behold there came up among them another, now here's the bio, another little horn, you see, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots, and behold in this horn, notice this, were the eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth. Notice that word, <laughs> mouth. Have you ever called anybody a mouth? <laughs> it means that do too much talking, maybe. <laughs> this guy had a mouth, and we'll, we'll see that mouth later on. But we, go way down, you see, Daniel interprets this. Uh, uh, he says, verse 19, Then when I know the truth of the fourth beast. And, and of course, 20, and the ten horns that were in the sand, you see. I want to know the truth of these. Look at 23. Then he said, The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth. And it, it is the fourth kingdom. You can see you have Babylon, Medo Persia, Greece, and then you have Rome, you see. Fourth beast upon the earth. And it shall devour the whole earth. He's going to have complete control of the whole earth. Now look at verse 24. Now this is vital. And the ten horns, those were mentioned earlier. It was the, the, they mentioned, you see, out of this kingdom are what? Now this is, this is developing, isn't it? Ten kings that shall arise and another shall rise after them. That's the, the small, isn't that the, uh, the little horn? And he's going to be diverse. He's subdued three. And notice what he's going to do here. Verse 25. Here, he shall speak great words against. He has a mouth, you see, hasn't he? Shall wear out the saints of the most high. And think to change times and laws. And they shall be given unto his hand until the time, times, and the dividing of the time. Now I'm going to go back to the image for a moment here. To explain something. I'm trying to get back to the, to, the, to the chart. Oh, here we are. Now, if you see this chart here, church period, rapture, church caught out, the church is removed, and straight away the beast is going to rise. Church is taken out, then shall that wicked one be appear, do you see? And he's then, he makes a seven-year treaty with the Jews, who will be back, and if the, you know, if I overlap this into the church period, the Jews are already part, we were there since 1948, and they will be here, and he'd make a treaty with them for seven, this period of seven years, you see. 
And uh, you see, he's going to, in the first part of this, so he's going to come in peaceably. You know, he'll make this treaty with the Jews. And you know something? If he makes a treaty with the Jews successfully, he's going to settle the Middle East question. And he's probably going to get the Nobel Peace, Peace Prize for doing it. That's why I say I think he's already been on TV. And you've noticed him. Because if the church is going to be taken out, and I believe that's what happened tonight, he's going to come in straight away. Then shall not wait at one second Thessalonians 2 be indeed. Now, he's probably been debating on TV. And maybe somebody, who oh, doesn't he know his stuff? You know, these guys come on. And he, you know, he attracts attention straight away. He's a great orator. And uh, it's an amazing thing to think that he could be alive and broadcasting even today, you see. And he's going to have this mouth. He's going to be a great speaker. And he says he'll speak great things against the God. In Second Thessalonians 2, when we saw that even earlier today, he's going to sit in the temple of God and he's going to proclaim himself what? God. The devil, the devil tried to do that in Isaiah 14. I would be like the Most High. That's what he said. He, he, he was trying to be God. And he wanted to be God, you see. And this guy, who we, we'll see his relationship with, with Satan very quickly here. Right, we'll go straight now to Revelation 13. Revelation 13. Revelation chapter 13 and verse 1. I stood upon the I stood upon the sand of the sea, probably the Mediterranean Sea, and I saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads, and notice this, and ten horns. Now, you can see this one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and then the ten horns that he has. And he's also a beast rising out of the sea. And upon his hands the names of blasphemy. Now I'm hesitating here because I was going to explain the seven heads. Those seven heads and those ten heads. Are, but my clock has beaten me. I'm going to leave that for some other time. But you, what, what you do to find out what the seven head, heads and ten horns are, you go to you find that out in Revelation 17, very early in the chapter. And you can do that homework. I'm good at giving homework, you see. I've spent 40 years doing that. So there's a wee bit of homework for you that you can do in your leisure. Now, let's read on here. And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet as the feet of a bear. Does that ring a bell at all? And his mouth as the mouth of a lion. Does that ring a wee bell from Daniel 7? It does. But you notice that in Daniel uh, 7, the lion came first and then the bear and then the, then the leopard. You see, but you see, Daniel's looking down that way through history, but John's looking back up, you see, and he sees the leopard first, and then he sees the bear, and then he sees the lion. And that's why you have them here in reverse order. It's just a matter of history. And here's the word, phrase I'm after. It says, the dragon, give him his power. Now look at verse 9 of chapter 12. It's just across your page probably. Verse 9 of chapter 12, and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent, 
called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. And he was cast out into the earth. You see, this is the, the devil gives him his power and his seat and great authority. This guy's absolutely in the clutches of Satan. Now look at verse 3. And I saw one of his heads. I was thinking about these heads, you see. I'd, I'd love time to explain them, but we just can't touch that. But one of his heads wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world uh, wondered after the beast. Now, and they worshipped the dragon, which gave power to the beast, and they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Now notice this, verse 5. And there was given to him a what? A mouth. <laughs> Here we have it, yes. Speaking great things, and was, was given unto him to continue. It's, we told this in Daniel 2. Daniel 2 says time, times, and a half the time. A time is a year, times is two years, and that's three years, and then half the time, that's three and a half years. You can get that in the Hebrew in the Old Testament. But here it just says 42 months. That's the same, that's, that's three and a half years. You get the same time in Daniel 7 as you get here. So there's no doubt this guy, we're actually as good as back in Daniel 7 here. Daniel 7 is a wonderful prophecy of the future, of what's going to happen, you see. Six, he opened his mouth and blasphemed against God. He, did, he does that in Second Thessalonians 2 as well. And, and all the rest of it. Given him make war. Look at verse 11. I beheld another beast. You'd say one is bad enough. Wouldn't you? <laughs> Here's another one. It's another beast. And... Uh, he says, it says here, uh, coming up out of the earth, he has two horns like a lamb. He's a bit of a mixture. Religion, of course, and speck as a dragon. He's devilish, and yet he's a mixture of devilish and, and, and religious idea. Exercises all the power of the first beast and causes other people to worship the beast. He does miracles as well. And in verse 14 it says, He deceiveth them that dwell near by those miracles. And he makes an image in verse 14 which, of the beast which had the wound by the sword and did live. Now just to say a thing about that wound that you have in, in verse 3, and you have it mentioned again in verse 14, that, that I believe that he'll be assassinated. Just like you've, you've, you've read of assassinations. Of, I, I remember... I was alive the time President Kennedy was assassinated. I remember that very well. And that has been played, replayed. He's, he, he has this wound by the sword or whatever it is. And he, he then probably, could I sort of say, he might do three and a half years or three. See, Jesus Christ died on the cross and then, oops, three and a half years and he rose again. And, and he might do this, he might be pronounced dead, assassinated, and then the time that Christ was, he'll suddenly, suddenly appear in TV. It says, look at verse 3, the end of it, all the world wondered. Oh, that's going to cause a mighty. <laughs> and, and they're going to say, you like him, all the rest of it. But that's, what, that's exactly what... Would you look down then to uh, uh, verse 16? And he causes... This is the second beast, of course. He causes all both small and great... And he's doing the task of the, of the first beast. He causes all both small and great, rich and poor, free and born, to receive a mark in their right hand and their foreheads, and that no man may buy or sell see if he had had the mark. And that buying or selling, it's not just shops, that's general trade. He's going to, he'll be, he's sort of has control of the world in that sense. And he'll bring out edicts about people buying and selling. 
Verse 18, here's wisdom. Let him who hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it's the number of a man, and his number is 600, three score, that's 60, and six. Six, six, six. You've heard of the mark of the beast, haven't you? And there's all sorts of ideas about it. I'm not going to go into those tonight. I, I'll simply say that uh, I read an article regarding what's happened sometime in the USA that prisoners in a certain prison and they, they were able to insert a chip in there. There's a hollow there between you. There's this lovely hollow there for a chip. A small chip. They were able to put it in with, with some sort of hypodermic needle. It contained all the information of the person in the prison. And the, the, by the time they'd been let out, and when he got out into that particular town, they had the screen and you could watch him moving about up and down streets. He got to the house where he lived. And because of this chip in his forehead here, they could follow every movement that he makes. That's amazing. And I'd say this, that we probably have the technology that will put into place the mark of the beast. You see, he'll, he'll have absolute control of everything that's going on. I wouldn't want to be living in what I call the tribulation, the, the judgments that are coming in that particular tribulation. Um, now I want just, I could look through history and I have details here on the, the history of the earth and all the rest of it. I could look through it. There's one of these leaflets that has have, have all the details, starting with uh, AD 70, working right through to the present. There's been no Antichrist, no Mark, no kings with a leader like this. There's no stone striking an image of it rising to the millennial or the millennium. No Armageddon and no millennium. As I look through history, I, I have no trace. I remember doing a series of these meetings in Enniskillen and there was a history teacher who, who worked in, what do you call the grammar school in Enniskillen? Quartora, yeah, good man, thank you. It's as well you came tonight. <laughs> Pertura, history teacher, he came, these were house meetings I was having, you know, and he, he said to me, threateningly, he said, I'll check you out. Boom, you know. And he came every night and sat there. And at the finish up, he had to admit that the Bible was a great history book. He told me that. Just, and he wasn't a Christian. And yet when he read all these passages, you know, he says, it's amazing what, 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 what's happening. Now, I, I, I'm saying, I'm asking now, is there anything in Europe today, is there anything that is happening that maybe causes a little twitch of excitement? You know? I have a few. You see? I want to... This doesn't seem to be working. Yes. Now what I'm going to do is, I see that, see that that's, that's Daniel 2's image. A lot of people try to bring these ten kings into the Muslim world, you know. But as I pointed out in the, when we were talking about the Russian invasion of Israel, Ezekiel 38, 39, Daniel 11, Joel 2, you remember, they were wiped out on the mountains of Israel early in the tribulation period, those nations, those Muslim nations, so they can't be part of this. But you see what happens here. The head and shoulders is this, it starts in the Middle East, Babylon, and then Medo Persia. And then it, this is sort of hidden. Is there another map here? Hi. Hey. Uh, 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 you, you, you believe me, underneath, <laughs> underneath that image is Greece. 
a lot of you are well into geography, so you know the geography of it. I thought I had another map of Europe. Is there another map of Europe? No. But just about in there is Greece. It goes down there. And then you have the boot, you know, Italy. It's like a boot here. But notice what's happening. You're starting in the Middle East, you're moving west, you get to Alexander the Great territory, and then you get into the Roman Empire. But where do the toes finish? The toes are finishing up in Europe. And I, I get a clue here as to what, what's happening in the movement of these nations. That maybe in Europe, I'm saying that, you might get something. Now I want to talk a wee bit about what we all know that in Europe at the moment there's the EU. Let's face it. Now it's significant that the founding treaty of what what has become the, the EU was the Treaty of Rome. That's when it started as the Treaty of Rome. That's significant. Gives it a sort of a a Roman a Romish start. And one of the great leaders of this was Henry Spack. Uh, here's what he said. He's one of the founding fathers of the EU and the, he was there at the start that when the Treaty of Rome was signed. He said this. Listen to this. I, I thought this was amazing. We felt like Romans on that day we were consciously recreating the Roman Empire once more. That's what he felt like. Recreating. And you see, Daniel 7 in the Roman Empire area of that, that uh, creature, Daniel 7, actually says something like that because it's in the Roman Empire that the thing is going to start. It's going to be nearly what you call a revived Roman area, you see. But then speaking about the euro currency, former EU commissioner, President Romano Prode, so we've looked at Henry Spack, it's now Romano Prode, he said, for the first time since the fall of the Roman Empire, we have the opportunity to unite Europe and bring back areas of the Roman Empire. You see? Now, those are amazing statements. And I want to just talk about a few things that have happened. Uh, the battery on this wee thing mustn't be working there. Oh, well. Now, the European stamp here, and this is, this is a lady riding a beast. Second election European Parliament stamp. She's riding the beast. That's just Revelation 17. You see, you get that in Revelation 17. And there's some other child thing. It says, so he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of the names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. That sort of talks about that beast, of course. We, we, we looked at the guy with seven heads and ten horns. That's amazing. But then, of course, outside the European building in Brussels, now, I don't know where you can make that out. You see, that's the beast, isn't it? And on his back is this lady. She's riding the beast. She's sitting on this scarlet-colored beast. Now, that's a statue outside. And, of course, you have the... You can see the, the, the stars, the 12 stars of the European flag. Those actually go round the head of the Madonna, you see. Twelve stars. I know that it's the woman in Revelation 12 is usually taken to be Mary. But going back to Joseph and his dreams, where he has the, the twelve stars too, the twelve stars meaning the twelve tribes of Israel, 
I would think that the woman there would be Israel. But it's amazing to see how sort of close to the Bible, and I'm not going into Revelation 17. Then you have your coin, this two-year thing, and even your stars, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Those are round the coin, and of course, in the center of it, you have the beast again and the woman riding it. Now, it makes me sort of uh, <laughs> get excited, if I put it that way. I think I'll, I'll throw off this coat of mine because well, I'm better about like this violence in here. Now, uh, it's interesting too, and I don't think this, yes, you see there's your European building in Strasbourg, and there's a fellow, a man called Bruegel, and he made a painting of the Tower of Babel, you know? And it's an amazing thing, anybody who's ever been there, you see, you know, you see, see the, the likeness of the, his projection from the Tower of Babel, which was a, really brought into a pagan Babylonish thing, and how like it is to even this structure here, if you look at it that way. I'm losing my star, my things here. And as I speak through it, will I? If I held it like that, I can speak through it, can't I? Hmm? This here. These guys are good, aren't they? <laughs> and I thank them very much for all the work that they do in this, you know. Uh, I'm trying to get the next one after this. Oh, yes. I want to just switch a little. Uh, there's a lot of things that I've gone through, and there's a lot of things as I look at Europe tonight have excited me as I look at it. I don't dismiss the idea of Europe involved in what's happening in Daniel 7. I get, I, there's lots of interpretations I could go in that, but it makes me excited. And I firmly believe that as we look at these prophecies and try to put them together and try to look at things that are happening even in the EU, it, it makes us excited of the wonderful fact that we are living in the last days. You see, and things are coming together as, as we look at that. But I want to just, in a moment, you'll give me a few minutes, won't you? You see, Lot's wife was in a place called Sodom. And it was a doomed city. Very soon, God's judgment was going to fall on that city. And it's the same with Noah. You see, there's no too terrible sin in the days of Noah. And then God decides he's going to send a flood. And, of course, Noah makes an ark and... There's terrible judgment, there's terrible sin, and then there's the judgment that's coming. But then there's a saving factor, there's the ark. Get those three ideas. As we sit here tonight in the church period, over into the, uh, the tribulation period, there's judgment coming. Some of the stuff that I've gone through, that this beast is going to be doing, is going to be, there's going to be seven seals, seven trumpets of judgment, and seven vials poured out. It's going to be a terrible time. You know, I remember doing this one time in, a, in the Scott Street Gospel Hall, and there was a 13-year-old girl, and she heard about it. And I happened to just say that the, the beast and the false prophet and the devil would finish up in the lake of fire, for that's where they're going to be put eventually. 
And she said to herself, why don't I don't want to be where the beast <laughs> and the false prophet and the Satan and, and the Antichrist are. She's only 17, but God spoke to her. And later that night she got saved at home. You see? God can speak in various ways. But what I want to say about Lot's wife was this. The first thing, Jesus pointed her out. This is what Jesus said. Remember Lot's wife. In, in Luke 17, verse 32. There must be something about that lady. She lived in Sodom, you see. Her position in a, a place which is doomed for judgment. And I tell you, we, we are the same. We, we are in a world at this moment that is doomed for judgment. You see, we can see that. But I look to at, more closely at her. Do you know something? She had a saved and she had a praying uncle. As she was down in Sodom, Sodom was down in the valley, do you see, near the Dead Sea, and up on the hills of Judea, you had Abram, and he was praying. You get his prayer in, in Genesis 18, and he, he knows. God has told him that he's going to destroy the city. God told him that. It's going to be destroyed. And Abraham knew that Lot who was his cousin and his family were in that city. And he went, oh God, he said, oh God, if there's 50, if I find 50 righteous, we just, God said, yeah, 40, 30, 20, 10. If I find 10 righteous, God, would you destroy? If you find 10 righteous, Abram, I'll not just. But you see, maybe he could have gone further, I don't know. But he was praying as I look around this audience here tonight, maybe there's somebody here tonight and you're not yet saved. People are praying for you. My mother was, was a lady of prayer. I remember creeping in at all hours of the night up the stairs, and I knew where the creeks were. Yeah. If I put my foot there, <coughs> no. But I knew, keep out a wee bit from that. And I had those stairs well worked out. But you see, my mother... As I passed her door, I could hear her praying. Oh boy, I was privileged. I had a praying mother. And she had to wait till I was 19 <laughs> before I got saved. Maybe there's somebody here and you, you have a praying family. I don't know, maybe there's people here and, and you have a mother and father praying for you. She, she had a praying uncle, that's why. She had a saved husband. Now, this is funny. Here. You said to me, was Lot saved? Now, hold on a minute. The Bible's very good in this. You go to the epistle of Peter. What does Peter say? That righteous man. Peter refers to him as righteous man. Lot, yes. And then not only that, it says... It vexed his righteous, the sin of the city vexed his righteous soul daily. As he sat in the gate, he must have been in a position of authority, maybe a, a mayor, Lord Mayor, something. But he sat in the gate of the city, and as, as the sin came to his, his ears, he was vexed because of the sin of the place. You see, she had a husband, a righteous husband. I just cast a bow at Avenger. Maybe there's a lady here. You're, you're not saved, but your husband is. You know? I spoke at a meeting in Castle Dawson. I'll never forget it. It was in the football grounds, the changing rooms of the football grounds. That's where I had the meeting. And I spoke in it gladly because I always speak where I can get the gospel out to people. And I was speaking on prophetic things that night. And I just mentioned there's going to be. The Bible says there's going to be two people in the bed. One's going to go at the rapture and the other one will be left. See? Two women grinding. One goes at the rapture and the other one's left. Two men working in a field and one goes on the other side. I said that. And when the meeting finished, I, I felt a bit hot and I went outside for a breath of fresh air because you, you, I do get a bit warm sometimes. But I went outside on the stand. This man came out with his wife. 
And his wife went on ahead and got into the car. And he came across to me. He says, you know, I'm not saved. Well, yeah. And he says, see that, see that wife of mine? She, she's saved. And he said, here's the way he put it. He said, we could go to bed tonight. And I could wake him up in the middle of the night and she mightn't be there. And he said, the, 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 the Lord could have come and she'd be taken to heaven. And he says, I'd be left. I never heard the leg of a trauma. And I looked at him, I said, would you like to talk for, no, 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 no. He went on ahead and got into his car and drove away. And I haven't seen him since. That's a reality, isn't it? You know? And that's what, that's what, she had a righteous husband. Now, now this is amazing. There was two angels came down into Sodom to get her out. Oh, now I'm not an angel, but I believe I'm a messenger. Angels are messengers, you see. And do you know what those two angels did? They caught Lot by the arm. They went into the house and they caught Lot by the arm. Come on, come on, Lot. Get. The judgment was coming, you see. Caught him by the arm. And even Lot's wife, uh, the other angel went to Lot's wife. And you have it in Genesis 19, the story, where the angel went across to, and caught, took her by the arm and brought her to bring her out, you see. Two angels. Now, there's not going to be two angels come to you, probably. <laughs> but I believe that God, maybe through something I have said, is maybe speaking to you. And I'm telling you, the, the coming of Jesus is close. And over there in, is the tribulation period. And I wouldn't want you to be left behind for, because those who are left behind will drift off into the tribulation period. That's the, the sad feature. But what, what happened? You see, they all got out of the house and Lot and his daughters, two daughters, were a bit ahead. And the judgment fell. And it caught Lot's wife. Jesus, Jesus said, remember Lot's wife. And she, it says, here's what it says about her. There's, it says she lingered. You know, she, she held back. Maybe there's somebody here tonight and you're holding back. That could happen sometimes. It says she looked back. I can see her going out of Sodom. And she looks back to the city. She longed. You know, I've seen people and they've come to meetings and maybe want to be saved. And they've compared the, 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 the meetings with the, maybe the lounge bar where they're enjoying their friends so much. And they've hesitated about the decision. They have looked back to the lounge bars or places like that. But then my third L is this, that she was lost. Lost. The Bible says she became a pillar of salt. I don't know, there's maybe somebody here tonight. And this fits you to the, every way. I wouldn't want you to leave tonight unsaved. I'd want you to come to Jesus because... Jesus did go to the cross for you. Jesus did suffer for you. Jesus did suffer the crown of thorns and the scourging and the mocking. He was nailed to that cross. He was there for six hours on a cross. And in the dark hours of Calvary, God laid on him the, the sin of us all. And because that has happened, I remember the night I got saved. And I got saved through that lovely verse in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3. Here's what it says. Christ died for our sins. And I thought to myself, if Jesus has died for everybody's sins, <laughs> he must have died for mine. And I was saved. I realized that and I accepted that. And 
Oh, I'll tell you, my sins tonight are all forgiven. I just pray tonight that somebody here would just come to Christ for salvation. Let's pray. Our Father, we come now to the close of this meeting. and Lord, as we've been looking at a lot of things in the Scriptures, and we know that the Word of God is so true, so relevant, so up-to-date. A lot of things we haven't even touched tonight. But we just pray that if there's someone here not saved, that this would be the lovely night when they would find Jesus Christ as Savior. Just pray this in Jesus' lovely name. Amen. Amen. Just remember the meeting next week. Uh, you'd be very welcome. And if there's somebody unsaved that you could bring along, that would be lovely under the sound of the gospel. Thank you.